Welcome back to week five of MKTG 2032, and it's a big one. It is the first of the double headers, and we are going to cover two slices of the marketing mix in this episode. So let's get into it. We're going to start with distribution, and digital distribution is an interesting, occasionally conceptually annoying prospect to deal with. First consideration is that if you are going to use a social media platform, that platform becomes your retail outlet, your wholesale outlet. So if you are pushing content out to the world and you are sending it through Facebook, Facebook is your distribution channel. But also distribution doesn't just purely cover digital delivery. And if you're using a platform like Depop, where you need to move physical objects from yourself to your buyer, then you have all sorts of other logistics challenges to consider. And this opens up the crossover effect. And the big crossover effect that I want to address up front is, do we want the customer to go to the value offer or does the value offer go to the customer? This is the, deliv the difference between home delivery and going to the shops. This is the difference between Uber Eats and takeaway and dining in. Where does the value need to be? At the conceptual level, for physical objects, we tend to get it. For digital objects, it opens up a question of, is it interest-driven search behavior that will bring people to us? Or is it subscription-based push media, push content? Now, why this becomes a challenge is that if it is search-based, then we are needing to use different parts of consumer behavior theory. We're looking at information search. We're looking at awareness generation. If it's subscription push-based, then we're using a different part of the Ansoft matrix. We are looking at existing customer, existing product or new product. These are crossover decisions. How our product, how our value offer, offering that has value gets to our audience is part of our strategic decision making that when we make it cascades back up the line or decisions we've made back in an earlier part of our decision cycle have to be implemented now. So if we're looking at wanting to push existing content to new users, we can't do that through subscription. We have to do that through search. Also, where is the value, and think SIVA for a minute, solution, information, value, access, the port of access, what value does that create in the co-creation cycle? Is the always on nature of a mobile phone valuable, or is it actually a hostile value destructive device if you're wanting privacy, if you're wanting not to have your every movement engaged, tracked, or otherwise? Similarly, access on the internet. Now, each platform has a certain level of cross interactivity. There is a service called If This Then That, which allows for some basic functional cross wiring that a post to Twitter can then be shared automatically through If This Then That to another platform. Uh, Instagram and Facebook are currently offering this because they're owned by the same company, that you post a photo to Instagram and it will be, you can select a little toggle switch and it'll post to your Facebook timeline. Post to your Facebook, vice versa. Now, the question you need to ask is, is exclusivity of content to one platform a source of value for that platform? So if we're thinking and you're operating a broad suite of platform tools, and you have Facebook, Tumblr, Twitter, Patreon, where does the value lie? Are there exclusive content items on Patreon? Do you use Patreon to set up an exclusive Instagram that is friends only and a, what is it, the Finstagram, the fake Instagram? Do you use exclusivity as a source of value or do you use multi-location as convenience? Follow us on 
and you have six different platforms that you update, so there's multi-channel. I'm using a multi-channel aspect in this course in that the video is on Echo 360 and the video is on YouTube because broader access creates greater value. Two different processes, two different platforms, two complementary value offers of the same product. Now packaging. Packaging is both physical, object, how do we get the object to the customer? Do we use resellers, white label services? Are we going? Are we drop doing drop shipping out of um, AliExpress? Are we doing drop shipping out of Alibaba? Uh, are we using eBay as our mechanism for management of physical goods, buying, selling, and then eBay's back end infrastructure that helps with postage and tracking? Do we have a system that will allow us to draw data straight from our PayPal purchases into printed mail labels, onto packages, and out the door? Those are considerations if you are wrangling physical objects within your e-marketing project. On the other side, though, is the digital package and the digital packaging. What is required for someone to operate your value offer? And this is actually an issue inside the e-marketing subject. Prior to the ANU licensing and Office 365 uh, full service arrangement for all students, handing out a Word document and a PowerPoint file was non-guaranteed to be able to be opened by a student, particularly when uh, Apple and Microsoft were feuding and I've been in this game long enough that giving out a Word document that was created on a Windows platform would not open under Microsoft Word in an Apple operating system. Packaging up your content into the right file formats, having it available on the right file repositories, the right there was a lot of work to make the digital packaging work. It's improved a lot. Things are much better. But even so, if you are going to develop an app, do you go iOS or do you go Android as your first target market? Because both have different shipping requirements in the digital packaging. The other crossover question, uh, starting to cross forward into things that you will need to think about in terms of your positioning strategy, which comes out of your segmentation, targeting, and positioning is influenced by your positioning strategy through your product, influenced by your price and what the price signals to the market, and then reinforced by your communications in the promotion. So where does the consumer expect to find the product? If you are platform exclusive, is the product exclusive to one platform and the promotion widespread? For example, you're available on, your content is available through Patreon. It is a subscription-based content service, but you operate on Instagram, YouTube, uh, Facebook, and Twitter as your promotional platforms to let people know that there is content of interest they should pay money for down on Patreon. Also, how would they look for you? Are you going to be using hashtags? Would you be able to be found with a hashtag? Are you going to be able to position against similar offers? If you like that, you may also like. Uh, can you get into the recommendation engine? And this is one of the things about YouTube. There's a certain level of production that you need to have done in order to be met by the algorithm going, yeah, you know what, that content, that content is similar enough to other content that we will recommend it. And there's a number of videos out there on YouTube about working with the YouTube algorithm. Look at the most recent ones. Again, it's one I'm not prepared to talk about in terms of the videos I create here because I cannot guarantee that it will be the same process in June as it will in July, August, or September. So I'd rather say, I'm going to outsource, go look at the people who are running live and able to make faster updates. Go check in with them as to how you can start using positioning strategies 
to encourage the algorithm to recommend you as the next piece of content. All right, we're going to pick up the product type typology from last week and bring it into distribution. And we're going to start bringing up some of the case approach here to put some examples to what is the theoretical framework that you want to turn into a very practical decision for yourself. So the first element, the digital intangible, where you're looking at a product, a value offer that is an idea or a value offer that is an experience. This often can be the broadest possible way. Uh, one of the things about coming from a social change, health marketing, behavioral change approach is that when we want to promote the idea of drink driving, anti-drink driving campaigns, or we want to promote the idea of smoking cessation, reduce the amount of cigarettes you're having, the idea is the product. The product is then able to be transmitted in the same sequence as the promotion. So we can merge promotion and distribution together, promote the idea and the idea is delivered at once. At some point, experience and experiential based marketing is harder to do. But equally, if you've ever watched a trailer for a movie and been more satisfied with the trailer than you were with the movie, you know that experience of the digital intangible, moving an idea and an experience without moving a product, a physical object, sorry. I make a lot of fuss about people not conflating those terms and I just did. Now, digital intangible, platform of choice, YouTube. Love it as a um, system, hate it as an operating um, battlefield because it's really, it's been messed up. That's the polite way of describing it is Google's lost the plot a lot on YouTube um, and it's harder than it should be and Google's not doing as well with it as they could. That said, the nature of your YouTube uh, experience is that you load it up on the app or in the browser, the video is played, and your experience of the video is the core value. So the value transfer occurs as you watch it. There's no transfer of data. There's no permanent transfer of file, object, or artifact. It's a digital intangible. If you haven't seen a YouTube before, this is what uh, one of my channels gets served up as its default settings. A mixture of house music, progressive house music, and professional wrestling. That is what my... Prof and this is my professional account. This is the YouTube account that hosts these videos, the recommended stuff. So when I'm uploading videos in the side, I'm watching uh, short, I've either got the big soundtrack on of uh, Progressive House for a couple of hours whilst I'm working, or I've got short bits I'm watching a bunch of wrestling and wrestling clips. So this all is digital intangible never resides with me, never sits inside the hard drive. Compare that to the digital tangible, which is twofold here. First one I want to talk to is this course uses digital tangibles. I hand out files like candy on Halloween and you can download them. They're available off the Waddle site. If you come to one of the live learning events, chances are I will flick a Word document out because here, have a file. The value of the file is its ability for you then to go co-create with it, to fill it out, to use it, to make it, to create with it. The other place I want to talk about the value of this is where you need a set of digital tangibles. You need software in order to facilitate a service. And in this case, we're going to talk about Steam. This is my, I mentioned this in another video that I have clocked up over 1400 hours on fights in tight spaces. I like different games. I like different game styles and I like my daily fix of the game. Fundamentally, all the rules are the same, but the challenge in the daily play is different. It meets that balance of novelty and nostalgia. But also to do it, I need to dedicate hard drive space to the files. I need to download, I need there to be a digital tangible object for me to engage with my online service. 
This is no YouTube, this is no digital intangible. Without those files, no product, no value, no co-creation. The next one up, the convertible intangible, I talked to this one quite um, a bit. In essence, you can use any one of the downloadable files that any of the PDFs, Word documents, or PowerPoints that I put up on Wattle, you can print out. If you find it easier to write by hand, take notes, you can print out those uh, PowerPoint files. The PowerPoint files that accompany this video. So that's the DLC. Uh, it has a couple of things to it. It has an operand resource. You need a printer. It has an operand resource if you then need to do stuff with it. I come back to digital 3D printing as one of the really good examples of operant and operand resourcing. In theory, downloadable to print at home should be a much bigger market than it is. It should be bigger because the idea of seeing, browsing, going, oh, I like that, press purchase, and the printer over on the side of the room starts clicking and worrying away and notifies you in 10 minutes time, hey, object is ready. I picked 10 minutes as a random number. The reality is there's a lot more mucking about between going and seeing something you want as a digital downloadable file and having it in the hand as a real thing. And part of that is it requires a set of skills in terms of setting up the printer, making certain the file is compatible with the printer software, lots of back-end mucking about, and the printers aren't that reliable compared to buying something off the shelf. So the convertible intangible, it should be bigger than it is. It's not as big as it could be. Market opportunities, I swear, here. Uh, on the other side, there's also the convertible intangible at the industrial scale, and this is where I will give us our case example, and that's through Hero Forge. And this combines a number of theories we've talked about previously. We've initially, for this to work, customer co-creation. Uh, when we explain Hero Forge, the whole idea of it is that it's a number of preset component parts that you can mix and match to create an object that is customized from menu. There is a finite number of elements that you then can put together to create something. So it's customization via menu, co-creation via menu, and its value comes from then being able to press the, go through the checkout function and have the object created by their equipment. So it's your operant resources of your skill and their operant resources of printing and shipping. Which does mean that at the end of the day, your Hero Forge objects can go from an idea in your head to a physical object in your hand, which isn't going to focus now, is it? I don't have macro on this camera. But basically, your functional approach here is you take your vision, a plague doctor, um, Grim Reaper, and you make it a reality, a miniature figure that you can use tabletop role-playing games, or as art pieces around your office, or as demonstration objects in a lecture. Now, there's also the convertible and tangible at the production and producer level, um, and this is using things like print-on-demand services. I am a big advocate of print-on-demand. Uh, this t-shirt collection I have uh, off screen here, where uh, I've used Vistaprint to create about 50 custom shirts, different designs and logos. Some of them are uploads of content I've created in Photoshop. Some of them are using their co-creation by customization toolkit. End of the day, I provide the input, they provide the output, and that's how it works as a convertible and tangible. My operant, their operant. In the middle here, uh, there is the convertible and tangible that is Redbubble. And Redbubble is a very useful platform, one that you should consider, particularly if you are looking for a combination of brokerage and of basically outsourcing your production. So one question you will be asked to discuss is about whether you want to retain the shopping cart or you would, that you host on your own site and the production of the 
goods that you want to sell that you stockpile in your own house, your own access points, versus outsourcing to a a market channel combination. So basically a print on demand service where you upload your content and they print it on a range of physical objects for you when someone comes to their store and says, I wish to purchase. So Redbubble is particularly good at this because there's a whole lot of platform flexibility. There's pretty much something for everyone in terms of the products that you can create. And it's a good secondary system. Uh, when we ta talk about the idea of commercializing your brand, commercializing your project, going and picking up the iconography and the brand of what you do, AKA this subject and its logo and its course designs, and then on selling them and creating objects that support it. There is, because it amused me, there is a red bubble store for the brand, but there's no requirement for you to buy it. Next up, transportable tangibles. Now, I want to separate this out from the stuff that gets created where you interact with the stuff on the screen, and then that content is the convertible and it gets produced off-site and sent to you. Here, what we're looking at is a protocol for shifting physical objects from one to another. And that can either be through a self-hosted market space. For example, you go to lego.com, Lego has the whole box and dice, or box and brick going on there. They've got the shopping cart, they've got the products, you buy from them, they mail it to you. Then you've got the disintermediation approaches of things like your Amazons. Uh, I say it in plural, but there is only one at the moment. There will be another soon enough. So Amazon, eBay, where the transaction is mediated and the transaction is hosted through a marketplace, but you still have to move the physical object afterwards. It's your responsibility to get object, which makes you a temporary shipping agency. Uh, we also have places like Etsy, where your job is to create the object, then put the object into the digital marketplace, have the digital marketplace handle the transaction, and you then handle the fulfillment. Make it, sell it, ship it, pay off the bills that cost to make it in the first place and make another. So with Etsy, you've got, a, you can see what I was shopping for. A combination of rock salt licks and strange candies and 3D printed battle necks. Probably sums up most people's weekend. What Etsy also does is you'll see a couple of little notes at the top there clothing and shoes, home and living, wedding and pet. Uh, see, Etsy has a number of product based segmentation tools. So you can look for subcategories of product and some of them are subcategories by usage, wedding and party. Some of them are categories by product genre, art and collectible. This tool allows you to start looking for where an audience could be. And also if you want to go to Etsy and you want to start selling products on Etsy, you can look, where do I want to position myself and what will my competition look like? You can work your way through this marketplace and identify what and where you want to position. So the thing about a tool like an Etsy as well is it gives you the chance to use segmentation from a different approach. This is segmentation by value offer. Now in the middle, we have some the mediated intangibles. This is online service delivery. Uh, this is where you are looking at a brokerage approach. It is pure service, but it also does co-creation through use. So PayPal, no use unless you're using it. You don't stockpile PayPal's unless you're Peter Thiel. Try not to be him. Bookings, restaurants, reservations, bar being able to make an appointment for your dentist without actually having to talk to your dentist until you show up at the venue. Useful, particularly when you've broken a tooth. 
being able to do brokerage based activities, precursors to offline services, booking your dentist, precursors to online services, Eventbrite for reserving tickets to a Zoom call. All of these things, the mediated intangibles, are about bringing services marketing into the digital space and meeting some of the challenges of services, but gaining a few others. The key here is that there's no transfer of ownership or intellectual property. It's pure service. There's no movement of objects. There's no movement of artifacts. Nothing other than the service experience. And PayPal, if you haven't, if you haven't encountered PayPal, you probably saved more money than I have. Big thing about PayPal is the there is a history to this of it being one of the most illegal things you could think of because it was a financial institution that was operating outside the regulation of the major banking service and it proved to be sufficiently valuable and useful that the banks bought into it. This makes it the complete opposite of Bitcoin because there was actually a point and a value and it provided a value in the marketplace of being a third party transaction and critically it was a third party transaction system that handled international payments long before the major banks ever thought about it. So a little history here, PayPal's killer application was I could send money from Australia to America with simply the translation fee of how I'm buying $50 US, you're selling it to me at 66 cents in the dollar. Okay, it's cool. That's 70, you know, I'm going to pay about $75 Australian for 50 bucks US and the transaction, whatever that works out, it's the exchange rate. And I'm not going to pay $17 for the privilege of sending a wire check that will take 28 days to clear. It will go through the PayPal accounts pretty much instantaneously. And that was its killer application. The banks wanted a monopoly over international transactions and PayPal beat them in the market. And somehow PayPal managed not to get legislated out of existence. Miraculous that. But what its true value was also was in small microtransactions. Being able to pay, and where it got its killer edge is that PayPal owned eBay. Now we talk about eBay owning PayPal or PayPal owning eBay. The same two groups of investors PayPal became the transaction payment method of choice inside the eBay infrastructure at the point in time eBay was massively growing through consumer to consumer sales as everyone was shifting secondhand goods to each other. It was a huge advantage to be the transaction. And also we had for a brief period of five to 10 years a quite flat global marketplace for moving objects from consumer to consumer. We don't have that anymore. It's nowhere near what it used to be. All right, theoretical things, discussion things, things to be aware of in distribution. Uh, first thing, consideration for you. The internet is a vending machine. It runs 24 seven. Hey, shadow hawkers. It's open all hours, but you're not. The web, websites, places like eBay, places like PayPal, they run on a 24 hour clock. You don't, you need to sleep. So social media cannot be a 24 hour presence. You cannot be live streaming 24 seven. There is a point, you can do that for one or two days. Don't cross 55 hours. Your average, um, average human will keel over from exhaustion and be very dead at 56 to 58 hours. Uh, we've discovered this by experiment um, in a number of uh, internet cafes around the world. So, what that says is basically upper caps around 48 to 50. Uh, when you're hitting about 48 hours, try, try and lie down, try and close your eyes. Yes, yes, it is something that we have actually looked at the maths on, don't worry. Um, try not to go past 24 hours, you're not that useful after 24 hours. But time independence and the fact that it's a 24 hour self-service automated vending machine led a lot of people early on to making the mistake of thinking that they needed to run hours 
that were bigger than they could service. The second thing is that it is a global network of locally produced outcomes. Biggest pain in the existence of the internet are the Americans, because the Americans and the American regulations and American Puritanism has a greater impact on what we can shift on the internet than anything we do anywhere else. PayPal, as big as it is, does not support a number of service products that are legal in a wide range of countries, which means you can't transact. You can't use PayPal to pay for a legal product uh, because PayPal says no. And that's it. PayPal says, nah, what you gonna do? So it's legal in my local area. PayPal won't support it. The internet is not a global flat network of unregulated conditions. It is overregulated because it is a global network of international business transactions bounded by every bloody legal system it's going to have to encounter. And it's a real pain because it's the absolute opposite of what we thought the internet was going to do. We thought it was going to liberate us and create more global and born global companies and global this, global that. What it turned out to do is basically locate businesses in the lowest tax regimes they could find. Hey, Ireland. And in the worst regulated areas they could find. Hey, America. And with the most Puritan outcomes they could think of. Also, hey, America. We've done some dumb things in Australia. We tried to have a war on encryption. Uh, we tried to ban encrypted end-to-end -end communication. <sighs> it was dumb. It stayed being dumb. And I don't care what you think people could have done with it. End-to-end -end encryption meant that your credit card worked with your bank. You ban that, your banking stopped working. You wouldn't be able to use PayPal, nor could you buy anything on the internet because there was no way to transmit the purchase information from point A to point B. That's why it was a dumb idea. It absolutely destroyed the ability of software to function. So we don't, uh, the international, the internet needs, you need to be as intentional in I want to be an international provider of materials to the world and go, oh, I'll do the global marketing subject and I'll get a global business major. You want to be an international operative, you've got to be an international operative. Equally, you can use the internet just to be local. There is a Facebook group for the apartment building I live in. Yes, it's run out of um, Facebook, which is based out of the US, but how local, local could you get then the 33 floors of apartment that I'm currently in recording this. So you don't need to be global by accident, you can be global by intent, but equally you can be hyper-local, micro-local, niche marketing. It's all about your segment and who you want to target. Uh, there's a couple of things here on the digital product advantage. Digital distribution is supposed to be better it is, largely, but there's also data rot. I, in my uh, Dropbox archive, I have my teaching materials back to 1998, but I cannot open any of the PowerPoint files from 1998 because the 2022 version of Microsoft PowerPoint can't open the 1998 PowerPoint files. I've got them, I just can't use them. So there is data rot, but equally there is a no, there's no theoretical upper limit to the duplication you can do of data, which is why NFTs are a really stupid concept because the functional value and purpose of digital product distribution is replicability and no theoretical upper limit on duplication. And a bunch of numb nuts went out and said, huh, what if we made artificial scarcity and priced it? Well, what if you uh, scam artists who are idiots? Because that's what you are, scam artists who are idiots. So if you're into that scam artist idiots side of things, steal their money, tie their shoelaces together, punch their apes, whatever. But remember, if it can be displayed, it can be copied. Now, 
distribution is going to loop over into price. The shipping cost is twofold. How much does it dollar, yen, Deutschmark, pound cost to ship? So that is the financial price. And how long will it take to ship? And we'll talk about a couple of those things in pricing. But basically, one of your problems you're going to run into is if it's going to change the product category. Now, case in point, I always come back to is the number of times I've gone to buy a t-shirt from a site. Because it's a kind of, it's a humorous, jokey t-shirt. And I'm like, hey, that seems kind of nice. Oh, 10 bucks. Go a bit of that. Oh, okay, it's 10 bucks US, so 15 bucks Australian. Fair enough. Shipping, $129. It's like, no, this has gone from cheap. This has gone from a positioning of cheap into this has gone to a luxury good. So you got to watch your total distribution. What does it do to your price positioning? And what does distribution cost, a top purchase price, do to your price total price concept and where your price is now positioned? All right, let's talk about the framework of the day. The paper of interest to us is looking at how would we use YouTube and Instagram to transmit scientific information, scientific knowledge. And for me, this paper gave me the opportunity to extract out an idea. And the idea was the six decisions. And I think these six decisions are a very good way as marketers to think about how would we deliberately transmit a piece of knowledge. And I want to quickly highlight the ethical and legal considerations of knowledge transmission, of telling the honest truth in a world that doesn't exactly reward honesty or truth, but also what is your legal consideration for transmitting knowledge that is legal in your jurisdiction, but illegal in someone else's? Where, does the where do the distribution channels come into effect? Uh, also, this is a really good paper for the crisis management aspect of, I work at the Australian National University. We have science communicators. Science communicators periodically go out and say, science, it's real. Climate change is a thing that is happening. Here is the data. And suddenly we've got a crisis management plan in there because they've got 100,000 tweets angrily saying, you're just scaremongering and trying to hurt children because you said climate change is real and we're having to go into our crisis management plan. That's a thing. It's a real thing. Uh, dogpiling uh, and hostile actors and a whole bunch of stuff. And this paper pulls up some of those ideas. All right, everybody breathe in. We have covered the first part. We've done the distribution. <sighs> Breathe in, breathe out, grab yourself a hand of something that's uh, palatable, perhaps hit the pause if you need to. It is about to be part two. It's the second shift. Welcome to the second part of the lecture. We're going to talk price. And you are going to encounter one of my favorite all-time theories. That is the concept of non-financial price. And it is something that we brought across from social change into the internet and boy has it taken to functionality of pricing like a duck takes to things ducks really like. So quick flashback if you remember value is based on the total price a consumer pays and Kotler back in 97 but Kotler also was one of the social change advocates who created uh, and facilitated this whole platform of non-financial pricing. Total customer cost has monetary costs and it has time, energy, and psychic. So this is an older idea. It's 25 years of being a useful idea. And let's talk about a couple of the key elements. So in the ugliest slide, you're going to see this um, session. Total price and the total price concept is the bundle of the financial outlay and the non-financial outlay that the consumer needs to forego the sacrifice they need to make to adopt your product. Now, if your immediate reaction is, hang on a minute, so 
People don't need to pay a damn thing to watch my Instagram. Well, that means you're all playing in non-financial price. If you are doing a subscription-based service, say a, uh, a YouTube community, which you have to join and pay a monthly fee for, then you've got a financial price. Same if you're running a Patreon or another subscription-based service site. If you are using a platform that distributes the content for free, there are then other elements that are part of the consumption, part of what, the, what your target audience, your target consumer, has to forego in order to consume your product. So the quick ones is in financial price, there is the dollar value associated with the acquisition, the use and the disposal of a product. And this might be a little familiar from a few other places. The disposal, the financial price disposal of technology can be anything from paying for the recycling through to uh, needing to get rid of something and replace it. Oh, I need that hard drive shredded. On the other side, the non-financial price. Time, effort, energy, compatibility, risk is the action observable to others. Financial, very important to remember that the non-financial price can also be a value within the product itself and that price is a communications tool that can explain or suggest or imply value to a target, a potential target adopter. So let's talk a little about the financial price and think about this in terms of, if we're talking about an acquisition cost. Most video games uh, have a base acquisition cost of you buy the platform, if you're buying a console, you buy the platform. You then pay the upkeep for the platform in terms of uh, your extension costs. You own the PS4, you own the PS5, you buy a game to go with it, that's a financial price of it, an extension acquisition. But equally, you buy a copy of Call of Duty and then you want to buy some of the DLC and some of the additional elements. You want to buy the expansion packs, you want to buy the next level of game maps. Those will also be a financial price to make the game viable. Then we have the financial price of use. Now sometimes there's a one-off use charge. You, know, you pay a $99.95 setup fee. Quite often this setup fee is then done as your immediate discount. Oh, we'll waive the setup fee. Or there's an annual subscription fee that gets waived for the first year. However it works, the one-off is a single payment that you make. The ongoing use charges are where there's a subscription fee. Now, I use a service called Invato. Uh, I use it for content within this site and a few of my other projects, and it is a monthly usage fee. It's an all-you-can-eat buffet of d digital data, and I suspect I'm on the high end of usage, because uh, I usually am on everything I use. But basically, it is all-you-can-eat transaction. Pay my 20 bucks a month, and all I can download, everything I want to use. Whereas on some of the other sites and systems, it's a one-off transaction charge. I want to buy this particular font, it's $5.95, done. Own it, using it. That's a one-off, whereas in Vato, there's a bunch of fonts, 20 bucks a month. Uh, you've also got things like subscription fee accesses uh, to buy premium versions of products. Now, YouTube has a, has a premium version, there's a premium edition of SoundCloud, there are premium copies of key platforms. And it's important to think about, do I need to outlay this price and outlay this money in order to get the benefits, or is the free version good enough? For example, Canva, which I've gotten, uh, I've recommended a couple of times in the live learning event, has a paid and a free version. You can get by this semester with the free version, or you may find, look at it and go, it'd be really useful if I had all the advantages of the paid version. I don't get it. 
I don't get kickbacks for this. I'm, I'm not that well organized. The last financial price element we do need to address is the microtransaction. And to address that, uh, that will be an unlock fee of 99 cents. Kidding. University won't let me do DLC. But the idea of the microtransactions and Diablo, the recent re-release of Diablo in 2000, in our year 2022. Oh my god. Diablo was an okay game when it came out originally. I played the first version of it. And by Diablo 3, it was a semi-sort of decent-ish, not too bad, solo experience. It was horrible as a multiplayer. It's just bad as multiplayer. Um, it encouraged a lot of negative behaviour. Ganking of newbies topped that list. To solve that problem became the pay-to-play, pay-to-win scenario. And the current version of Diablo that's come out is to max out your character is probably going to be dropping about £15,000 or thereabouts. It is a stupid amount of money that no sentient creature should spend on software. But also, Fortnite. Fortnite had cosmetics. And they say, oh, you can't, it's not pay to win with us. We're just going to have different ways in which you can, your character will appear on screen. Some of those different ways that you can appear on screen give you a greater advantage because it's an all black stealth suit. Not pay to win, just cosmetic. There's a lot of ethical pr problems here when we're talking about loot boxes, when we're talking about microtransactions to pay for more game time. Uh, when you have lives in a game that are time limited or resources in a game on a mobile device that are time limited, that you can skip the time countdown by paying microtransactions. There's a lot of dark patterns, a lot of dark side stuff here. It's also, you, got, you don't have to live with yourself because most of the people who do this just don't give a damn. Uh, but you don't have to do this. It's still viable to have one-offs and still viable to have non-subscription based services. It's still a thing. And we should push harder as consumers, push back against we have to pay for every click or movement of the mouse. All right, exit fees, uh, disposal charges. There are contract cancellation fees that occur at a variety of um, online services. <sighs> Captain Bastard, I mean, the Adobe uh, Premiere, if work wasn't paying for it, I'd probably be finding a different tool other than Photoshop, as much as that would suck. Because I really like it. Photoshop is a very good tool. Adobe Premiere is a very good tool. But if I was doing it as a personal individual, I would hate to be dealing with the contractual arrangements that Adobe puts in because they also have really stupid, high, expensive cancellation fees on a digital product. Terrible idea. And also, if you need to use a hard, complex, difficult unsubscription approach, looking at you, Wall Street Times, and most of the Australian uh, newspaper digital subscriptions. Your product sucks and you should go broke. If you can't let people go as easily as you can bring them in, then you deserve to be hit with every full force of the law for anti-competitive behavior. There is no moral justification as a marketer to do that sort of absolute rubbish. It might be able to be justified out of accounting. You could possibly come up with a rationale in economics, but no, as marketers, we draw the line and say, no, it is unethical, it is unacceptable, and we should fight against that sort of thing being brought in because what it does is it absolutely guts the value proposition of the product. If we have to put locks on our customers to stop our customers from leaving, what we are signaling loud and proud to the world is our product sucks, our value offer can't be co-created, and you're a fool if you buy in. And as a marketer, I think that's a really bad way to pitch and position a product. Okay, let's switch over to the non-financial price. Here's the quick rundown of what they are on the screen. You have met a couple of these before. Risk shows up uh, as we've had it in consumer behavior. 
and it's a feature. Remember, risk is something you can sell. Every aspect of time price is also part of price is capacity to, to be used for communication and positioning. Equally, there are pricing strategies. There is prestige pricing, there, which is the pricing you use for a luxury good. There are price skimming. There's price, a whole series of price strategies. They all apply to non-financial price. A non-financial price prestige pricing approach to time says you can afford the hours to use it. A price skimming is make it as quick as you can. Really, I'm going to say time price has been the biggest challenge for this subject. Effort price. This is an inexpensive subject. MKTG 2032 is a prestige time and prestige effort price subject. Learning curve though, I'm kind of trying to keep that around um, sort of the skimming. Energy, uh, look, because it's high effort, it's also unbundled high energy. Lifestyle, relatively low cost. Risk, mm, I'd like to say it's low cost, but it's mid, mid tier. I do a lot of risk repricing to re turn the risk price into risk feature to risk benefit. But let's go play with the component parts. Time price. To speed run this course, it would take approximately 48 hours. Uh, I say approximately because I haven't fully done the maths yet, but effectively you're looking at 12 weeks worth of content, roughly one hour of video per week on average. Week one, week five, about an hour and a half each, so three hours, but it gets shorter later in the semester. Uh, so that's 12 hours, put in the seminars, uh, if you do it through the shadow mode, that's another 12 hours, you're 24 hours. Then that leaves you 24 hours to write the remaining assessment tasks, splitting that up across, say, uh, fours and sixes, four hours for the uh, ET, four hours for the ETPR, uh, six hours for the... Uh, e-portfolio and your remaining change spread across the miscellaneous elements you need to do to engage the forums. Wouldn't recommend it. I, I, I wouldn't recommend 48 hours blitzing the course. To start with, you can't do it in a single 48 hours because the two due dates are in separate locations. But secondly, geez, it would hurt. <sighs> but the thing with time price is, again, Low time price, quick and fast, can be a prestige. You pay extra money for it to be quicker, or it's a skimming. You're only just going to scratch the surface. You're going to read the too long, didn't read version. You're going to watch the highlights reel. Now, by the way, if you want to speed run uh, the lectures, is that you would read the PowerPoints. You wouldn't get any of the examples or explanations, but you'd be speed running. The non-financial price of effort. Now, I've always po point to Tough Mudder. Um, it's a real-world thing. It's had some troubles during the plague. It's weird. Uh, but basically, the idea of physiological expenditure that makes things harder, uh, the fact that DIY, you occasionally will pay more if you have to do more work, this is the thing we know about. Which also means that there are certain points. Linux, the software platform Linux, and a shout out to my one or two Linux users who are out there. Yes, I know you're out there. Yes, I know you're morally superior to the people using Windows and Mac. And yes, I know that it is a bucket load harder to use Linux. And my God, do you love that effort price that you have to pay? Because that gives you mastery. Effort's psychological companion part is, it is difficult, therefore I am good. The higher the difficulty price I'm paying, the better I am as a an operative of being able to do it. And I say this because by the Elvises, I do this myself. I do things that are more complicated than they need to be because I want to show the mastery and the control and the damn, I'm good. And I want to show that to me. Learning curve. Speaking of difficulty levels, the existence of Dark Souls 3. As a game, it sucks. 
Oh look, on the surface, let's be blunt about this. The whole Dark Souls genre of ridiculously hard, almost impossible to win games that require you to put in a stupid amount of challenge. Your learning curve goes like, yoink, it is dumb. If you're not into it. If you're into it, it's the best thing ever. And I say this as someone who's into picking up pieces of metal and putting them back in the same place they came from until they get progressively heavier and I'm in a considerable amount of biological pain because I've induced a whole bunch of micro tears into my muscle structure. Or as it's commonly known, going to the gym. So I can judge because I can judge from a position of expertise. Learning curves where something is really difficult. And I've got a bunch of games in my Steam library that are really difficult. And I went, I don't really enjoy this. I don't have a good fit. So I got rid of them. But equally, if you look at flow state, that balance between challenge, difficulty and skill, there is a need to keep upping the ante on the difficulty level so that the skill gives that same reward or that slightly better reward. So difficulty, learning curve, something being complicated is not a barrier to its adoption. It is a feature to be worked with to the right market who craves it. They crave that mineral. Energy. All right, this is the amount of how draining is it to do something. And for all of us who come off the back of our Zoom calls and we're like, oh, I am so dead. I leave my soul somewhere on the internet when I do these videos and I do the Zoom calls and it's worth it because I will come out exhausted. I will come out physically drained. I'll be like, dang, that was good because I'm prepared to pay an energy cost. Other people may not be. I mean, we've got this whole concept of doom scrolling because it's just energy sapping to keep constantly updating your feed to see the next crisis as it plays out in real time. But also, this can be a feature. Low energy. Remember those times where you go, yeah, I just want I just want to veg out on the couch. I don't want something that makes my brain work. Versus those times where you've absolutely craved, I've got to expend the stuff that's happening in the grey matter. You have choices around this. And again, embrace it as a, an element to make strategic decisions. Prestige energy price. Skimming energy price. Lifestyle prices. Does it fit the brand? Do you fit the brand? Does the brand fit your lifestyle? Uh, also, this is a really interesting one, is that lifestyle ties into visibility of the product. Now, there are, I know, because I do a lot of consumer behavior research, and I spend time on the internet, the concept of cringe, the concept of people having a physical, visceral, negative reaction to something they see on the screen because they feel third-party embarrassment. That is a lifestyle cost as well as a psychological cost. To embrace, now I keep making fun of cats, 2019, but there are some points where the lifestyle fits and it is a value add. There are some things where to use the product it would go against the lifestyle that you have proclaimed to others so you can't visibly use it and therefore its visible use would be a price and expense that you're not prepared to incur but you could also lifestyle cost it to the private version of you that doesn't get displayed online but should that ever come out it'll probably go badly there's also the financial risk uh, like risk, we've talked about a bunch of it. Financial risk and risk in price is it doesn't do what you want it to do. Line go up, right? For all of you who have been going, oh, I should get into Bitcoin. Put that money into hard alcohol and good drugs and make art that you'll have a better time, more fun making it. It doesn't matter if you sell it at a loss because it doesn't matter if it's an NFT, you'll have had a very good time making it. But the thing about risk is risk is also a feature and it's part of the price tag. And all the factors that we've talked about previously is risk is about the possibility of loss and that loss being greater than the reward 
that is incurred through the danger and the sense of danger of that potential loss. So I've mentioned a couple of price strategies on the way. I want to pick this up on the way through. Satisfaction-based pricing, really important thing is it is a risk reduction. You're trying to increase the overall sense of the value of this particular value offer is worth more than the non-financial price and financial price you will incur. Early days of Tumblr, there was a lot of work done around by individual Tumblr operators to try and create a satisfaction-based pricing. And there'd be catchphrases like, if you are a teen, you must follow this blog, or best blog for follow. And you'll see this idea of, you see it occasionally in AliExpress and eBay, where people put in the keywords of that are about reducing the risk. Best gift, wild, wacky, for friends, um, humor, fun, gift, dad, father's day, novelty product. And it's a talking fish, bass, mounted bass on the wall. But all those keywords are not just SEO hacking. They're all about finding that right combination of words so that when you type in best father's day gift for dad, what you are looking for is satisfaction based you're looking for a satisfaction-based pricing outcome that reduces all the risk factors. The other approach to go is benefit-driven, that there is a, again, think co-creation of value. You are laying out the value offer and your pricing is set up to allow people to buy into the elements they want that they see as being useful for their value co-creation with your outcome. And that can be done by membership levels, it can be done by membership tiers, it can be done by access, it can be done by insider information. There's a whole bunch of different ways. Your trick is to start thinking so how some of these finance elements, like benefit-driven pricing has predominantly been thought of for the financial. How would you do it for non-financial? And how can you use it in your own projects? Flat rate pricing uh, doesn't really work as well on non-financial as it does on financial. And also it's not really great. Uh, the economists, you can tell me off for this and accountants, you can tell me why I'm wrong. But it uh, always makes me nervous. Uh, particularly given the volatility of the market and for my case, geez, I hate the exchange rate sometimes. I price it in Australian, I pay it in American and it goes horribly wrong. On the other hand, though, relationship pricing. This is something that uh, Patreons, now I've got SoundCloud up on the screen there. Have a look at this in terms of there is a basic service that can be the formation for the trust, commitment, and reciprocity. SoundCloud works on the assumption that in the long game, after you've used SoundCloud for a while and you've gained value, the reciprocity will come from you going, yep, yeah, it's worth me upgrading and going up to the next tier and going to the annual subscription fee. And they are right. Because on a number of projects and number of products, I started off on a free account and went, damn, this is good. I want more. Not just the free trial. I went, I want to pay the money to make certain this service continues being there for me. The other thing to uh, factor into our idea is price bundling. Now, we're used to seeing this as financial. Uh, can you tell I was buying for a friend's cat? Where Amazon's really good at price bundling. They're one of the best financial price bundling operatives on the planet. There's probably nobody better. Not even the airline industry. But price bundling as a concept is to try and bring together a... to hit a sweet spot worth of multiple possible value solutions in the one transaction. Your task is to think, how would you price bundle non-financial? How would you bundle risk and social and lifestyle and psychological into the one bundle set? Uh, also, uh, Steam does, so the best is Amazon. Second best is Steam. And their complete the set price bundling is, it's, I've been caught by it dozens of times. I have bought packages where it's been like, 
I could buy just the one game for $29.95, but I could complete the entire set for $35.95. Did I play the other games? No, but I completed the set. And it resonated with my little completionist heart that I was able to buy the other parts. That I didn't use them isn't the point. I was value in use, not value for the game, and I was value in ownership for the completionist. Uh, adaptive pricing, this is price by menu. This is customization based pricing. For financial price, this is one of the easiest ones you can do. Uh, now this is Vistaprint, where I decided I would try and create a set of e-marketing business cards or postcards, I think it was. Uh, and it gave me choices. I could upgrade the paper stock and the, the lo lots of little tweak up adaptive pricing. So I could choose between quality levels to create, to customize the product I wanted to the level that I was prepared to spend. So it was a really good upsell technique and it works quite often on me. Uh, pulling adaptive pricing into non-financial would get really interesting when we start looking at do you, you can do this when we start looking at things like complexity levels. Uh, I did kick around the idea of doing adaptive pricing for difficulty on the subject where at the start when you logged into the LMS you had to select the difficulty level easy, medium, hard, nightmare. If you'd selected nightmare, there would be no videos. There would just be the assessment tasks. There would be no other supporting material, just the assessment tasks. And once you selected nightmare mode, you could not go back. Oh, uh, I would also have made the assessment tasks different to the not nightmare mode. Because I know that your first thought would have been, ha ha, but Stephen, I've got a friend who's doing it on easy mode. It's like, yeah, thought that through myself too. That was my first response was, oh, I can select nightmare. Hey, Dr. Hughes, could you go select this on easy mode for me? No, if you're doing it adaptive, we're doing it for purpose. But you could use this technique in non-financial. Uh, so that's the thing, adaptive price strategies, sizes, shapes, distribution channels, minimum purchase sizes, bulk purchasing. There's a whole bunch of different ways. The total price concept, this idea, we raised it right at the start and I want to bring it back here is as e-marketers, you need to be very conversant with the total price, but your customer doesn't. Your customer can just go, hmm, I want to buy this, I can afford it. You need to understand what affordability is for them, what accessibility through SIVA means when we come back to price, because it is also something where free shipping. Well, someone's paying for it and I suspect I am. So it's not so much free shipping as it's bundled shipping price. It's not surprise shipping. It's, well, this is the transaction cost I'm going to pay. The shipping is now a thing. It's in there. It's embedded. So total price concept. Most of the time we think about it for financial. Your task this semester is to really deep dive on what are the non-financial prices people pay to access your content over the internet during the course of this project? What is it and how can you use it? How can you use it for positioning strategy, for communication of value, to attract the right market and to repel the wrong audience? And that is why price for signaling is a key. And look, as much as I have very, very unpleasant things to say about Diablo, if they can convince someone to part with 14,000 pounds, and that someone gets value back for that 14K that they've dropped on the Diablo, there is also the moral question of who are we to stand in the way of that person getting their co-created value? And occasionally I've look at things and go, I'm so not the target market. I, I, you know, I don't want to be the guy who drops $5,000 on a video game. Yet equally, I would be the person who has spent $5,000 on computing hardware, not without thinking, but definitely without blinking. Um, 
the War Beast, the machine that runs the live learning events and I use for the on-demand recording, is now climbing close to about $20,000 worth of hardware value. That's a lot. That is not a cheap object. But it is, for me, what I bought into. Now, price for signaling, I know that damn thing is good, but also I know it's bragging rights. I can go brag to other people in the field and it's like, hey, that's the rig I run. Similar things happen in branding, happen in clothing, happen in fashion. They are available to happen in digital and they are available to happen signaling again. I've put in the price signal here around more of the financial, but equally, the different visual cues that somebody has outlaid more money than somebody else or put in more time than somebody else is a signal. And that signal can be for prestige and that signal can be done through financial and non-financial. And that signal leads into branding and it leads into the value of an intangible object inside a virtual world where we know that brands matter in the physical meat space. Which brings up uh, one of my favorite things in existence. Look, I talk smack about Diablo because I think Diablo is stupid. Um, I think the pricing structure is grossly non-representative because it's microtransaction rather than one-off. And I think it's really hysterically funny that we have a market for Counter-Strike Go skins. Uh, but the market's been, well, mostly stable. If you take a look at the scores here, top objects worth about 60k US, which means, and here's the thing, somebody's got $60,000 American that they're willing, or actually at the moment, not willing, no one's bought it. But if we look at the list, the, there has been a transaction, a couple of transactions on the lower tier. So some of the ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 objects have moved. So what you're looking at here is there are people out there with enough money to go, it is worth to me a prestige premium. Now say I was running a high-end influencer account and I was a YouTube uh, superstar and I was banking this and I could make it a cost. I'm going to go do an episode on Counter-Strike and I'm going to go play Counter-Strike and I'm going to gift some guy who I play up against. I'm going to put one of these skins on the line and I get my 20 million views because they want to see whether, you know, we both wagered a Counter-Strike skin of extreme expense and we make more than that back on our advertising, then it's just a business cost. This could be business to business transactions and business costs. The other thing is I've got reasonably good sensation that some of this is just straight up money laundering. In which case, good on them. Best of luck to them. And don't forget, at tax time, Earnings from digital products are still earnings that digital virtual objects that bring you real money dollars bring you real money taxes. A couple other things on price, uh, convenience pricing. The data digital speed versus how much will I pay to get the product. And yes, I was looking at a cat statue for this. Can I just say, by the way, Amazon was doing, and it's, you can see there, they've got the free expedited international delivery with Amazon Prime. I've never had a company get in the way of a screenshot quite so severely as Amazon did during this promotion because it kept offering me free shipping. It wasn't showing me shipping prices. It took ages. I'm thinking, what's the weirdest thing I could ask Amazon for? That a physical object that would have differential speeds of transport. And I finally figured it out. So, uh, premium speed versus waiting discount. Now, one of the things that always amuses me is when I'm looking at eBay or I'm looking at Amazon and they go and have, this time the tiered pricing works, get by Sunday, July 10, 13, 43. By July 7, 26, 67. I have before now seen the price being expedited international delivery. Get it by July 10. 
ten dollars. Get it by July seven. Five dollars. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> it's faster to get it sooner. There's, a, I can pay more for slower. There have been the occasional trade-offs where it's gone wrong um, for whatever the automated calculation system has done. Question is, can you bring convenience pricing to non-financial? Um, is there a trade of shipping, of speed, of non-financial? But also there is a trade of risk. There is a set of, I will wait six months for the product to show up for me. That's putting risk up of, will I have, will I have had to move house? Will I remember what I ordered? Will I remember why I ordered? And periodically, I have gotten packages in the mail, opened them up and gone, why did I buy this? Because at the time, I had a purpose for it. And by the time it shipped through all the various shipping delays, I'm like, I do not remember why I got this. All right. Closing up a couple of the theories for you to use. These are applied more than they are theories. Every time you consciously engage with pricing, you do so at three decisions. You are either above the market and therefore you are doing premium pricing. You are at the market, therefore you are contesting on product superiority, relative advantage. Or you are below the market and you are competing on price. That's it, it's either above on or below. There's no other way you can do it. If you're giving away for free, you're below market. If it's price on application, please don't, but your chances are you're at market. Now what those do is that they create a set of consequences. If we take below average, average and above average, and we combine them into financial price, and we combine them into non-financial price. That gives you nine positioning strategies. And those positioning strategies can then bleed over into your promotional strategy. And here's your matrix to make a choice from. If you are on YouTube, you are at the same financial price as everyone else on YouTube. The question then becomes, where are you on the non-financial price? So you are contesting somewhere in a me too, or you're an average financial price, you're the same financial price as the others, you can't be cheaper, you can't be less than your opponents because everyone's giving away for free on YouTube, unless there is a community, in which case that would be above financial price for the community. But then you have to go and say, well, same financial costs, um, superior features for the same price. That is competing on value. Equal, you are not really competitive. You're just one of many choices. And there's also when you're out of season, when you're out of stock, you are more expensive than a non-financial, but you're not more valuable. And that's a challenge. And it happens. So give it a consideration. There are ways you could, you could make an average financial price and above average non financial price work for you, but that is a riskier proposition than the others. So there are some negatives in the game, but there are also, every negative can be attacked as a source of a value proposition for the right audience. Let's talk about that last paper now. Let's wrap this up. And here we have is, a cost and that is a price of leaving now I know I critiqued leaving costs and exit barriers because I don't actually think they're ethical ways to conduct yourself I've always hated it when we did it in social marketing and social change and I don't think much of it when we do it in e-marketing because my strategic worldview that I take is you should always fight on the value proposition of your product. You should always be pushing hard to create an offering that is valued to your audience rather than pushing to make it more expensive to go somewhere else. Now, the mooring cost that's raised here, so the key idea, key takeout I took out of this is the mooring cost. 
and that is potentially around things like fear of missing out. You don't want to unsubscribe from this channel because you want to see the content, uh, but you, at the same time, you loved it a few years ago, but it has just hasn't been the same since, and hasn't been the same recently, but you don't want to give up because you used to love it, and maybe you'll love it again. That's a mooring cost. Uh, what it says to me is that you are now no longer the right audience, and you should move on. So, again, one key idea. So how it works is you take the paper, you read the paper, you find the idea you need, and you take that idea and you apply it into your project. It's week five, and you've submitted an assignment. Functionally, I could say that mooring costs have now taken effect because you have committed down into this subject by that submission of that assignment. Reality is, I will back you. If you want to bail out of this subject, I will go and say, yep, this student should be allowed out of this subject, and I'll do what I can to support you, because I do not believe, as a marketer, it is not in my strategy set to use more in costs. I don't like them, and I don't think they're the best strategic use, but they are my case example here, because inside this paper, that was the key idea, is that this explains the mooring cost and it's something that I can then use to cite and say, hey, it's not a theory. It's a theory that explains something I don't want to do. I do not want to create competitive barriers to people adopting other products. I will choose different. And that's what this framework is about. And every paper has a, an idea that you can use as a support or you can use to be a contra, an antithesis, a counterpoint. Here is the theory. The theory says this is a way to conduct yourself. I want to do differently in practice. I now have to explain what this is and why I want to use a different path. And I can because the key idea is the idea I take out. All right, as always, if you need me, you know how to find me, you know where I am, and you know the systems to access. And with that, it is the first doubleheader of the season. It is price and distribution, you have been my audience, I have been your presenter, and I will see you for episode six, where we talk about promotion. Mm.